Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. These stories were first published around April 1910. They are about Lord Lister called John C. Raffles the most brilliant among all thieves. He is the terror of usurers and money lenders, robs them of their possessions by his wiles, protecting beleaguered innocence and supporting the needy. Man of honor in all respects. He persuaded that many abuses, protected by law, continue to proliferate with impunity. Every effort is made to apprehend Lord Lister, called John C. Raffles, the most brilliant of thieves. Reward, £1,000 sterling. Lord Lister the Black Man in the Bedroom by Gert Matchell and Theo Blakenzy. Chapter 1 The Disappeared Jewels In the quiet, dark Diagardistra the light that shone from the villa of the Bank of von Hartstein cast its bright gleam. Carriage after carriage drove ahead, livery servants rushed over, opened the door and led the ladies in light evening cloaks and the gentlemen in skirts or uniforms inside. Everything that could call itself beautiful and elegant in the capital and residence, as well as everyone who was famous and well-known, gathered in the house of this man, the famously wealthy director and owner of the principal securities bank. The seductive dance music rustled in the lavishly decorated room with flowers and palm trees. Hidden behind the most beautiful tropical plants played a famous gypsy chapel, which had been brought over from Vienna at great expense. The sweet melodies also resounded in the adjoining rooms, which offered the most delightful places for cozy whispering or flirting after the fatigues of the dance. The ballet master, standing in the great hall beneath the gigantic crystal gas crown adorned with garlands of roses, had just signaled a quadrille to begin, and the slender, elegant women and girls were seen moving between the black skirts and glittering uniforms of lords. The merry laughter and the jesting words were heard now and then above the notes of the music when suddenly, about the middle of the hall, a striking confusion arose among the dancers. The gentleman, who was distinguished among these four pairs by his particularly handsome, masculine figure, signalled the ballet master, whereupon the latter silenced the orchestra with a wave of his hand. General curiosity arose to find out the cause of this disturbance, but already after a few seconds the music played again. The dance continued and only a few persons came to know that the young and charming hostess, Adelheid von Hartstein, had lost her necklace, which was composed of the most precious diamonds and rubies, and of fabulous value. As soon as the quadrille was over, a great number of servants appeared in their grey silver trimmed liveries. With keen eyes they searched the whole hall several times, without, however, finding any trace of the lost necklace on the smooth parquet floor. Adelheid von Hartstein, with her slender yet well-filled figure, her deep blue childish eyes and the soft face framed by curly blonde hair, was a beautiful woman, and everyone should notice how well, precisely because of the great contrast, the gentleman with her fit, on whose arm she was now moving to enter one of the side rooms, where her husband, the banker, was amusing himself with the game. Lord Brigham did not have the usual appearance of the Englishman. His wavy hair was jet black, and a pair of black eyes glittered above the typical nose. The finely trimmed lips were visible beneath the small, cropped moustache. But the chin showed willpower and the lithe, muscular body indicated extraordinary strength and agility. Lord Brigham descended from one of the oldest aristocratic families in England and thus had relations in the best circles. Today, however, he was for the first time the guest of the Bank of von Hartstein. I hope this incident has not displeased you, madam, he said in his melodious voice, it is safe to assume that the necklace will be recovered. The young woman did not seem to share this opinion entirely. Looking at her cavalier, who was a head taller than herself, with her wonderful blue eyes, she answered. I don't know, my lord, I have a vague feeling, as if something. Yes, I don't know how to express myself. You don't believe, Madam Baroness, that, well that the necklace has fallen into less desirable hands? She shrugged her shoulders without looking at her cavalier, and her voice sounding timid, almost childishly timid, said in a low tone. After all, we are here among friends, I mean, among our guests. 
so it would be bad of me if I dared even remotely suspect someone. She hesitated a moment, then went on. It is so remarkable. In the same instant I had the feeling to feel the necklace about my neck. One gets used to it and if one wears those valuables all evening, then one misses something when they suddenly disappear. And so I noticed that it suddenly became so light around my neck. She glanced at her low-cut salmon-colored silk gown, and the gentleman's admiring glances followed hers in the lace trimming which encircled the fairest bosom and the most charming woman's neck. Bank of von Hartstein must already have been aware of what had happened, for he was already meeting his wife and ushering her and Lord Brigham into a more distant, hitherto unlit cabinet, where he turned on the electric light. He allowed himself to be told exactly what had happened and, like his wife, was concerned that the diamond necklace, which had been lost in the middle of the hall, had not been found. Yet he consoled his wife and pointed out how easily one of the ladies with her train could have pushed away the precious jewel. I beseech you, my lord, he said urgently to the Englishman, let not your mirth be disturbed by this incident, and if you will please me, do not speak of it to anyone. I would not want the painful case to lead to erroneous inferences. Nothing can disappear in my house. For this my tried servants and the friendship of my guests guarantee me. Lord Brigham bowed. A little pause arose between these three persons, who were each occupied with their own thoughts, but then the blonde woman said. It is remarkable, Maximilian, and you know that we have often had to change personnel lately. The banker shook his head. Excuse me, dear child, but you don't see that very well. A bourgeois could do nothing with an object of such great value. No one buys those stones from him, and besides, do me the pleasure of forgetting the whole thing for the time being. Believe me, I have already solved more difficult problems. And if the necklace should really be lost, he said with a smile, then we will get over that too. And now I don't want to disturb you any longer in the conversation with your cavalier, who will most certainly be able to put you in a good mood again. At these words the banker, in whose face a pair of penetrating eyes sparkled behind brilliant spectacles, turned with a polite smile to the Englishman, who offered Mrs. von Hartstein his arm and led her back into the ballroom. The banker, whose head was already almost completely bald, waited a moment, then followed the couple, pushed his broad-shouldered, short body through the gentleman who stood before the entrance to the ballroom, and disappeared behind a side door. A few minutes later he was in his private office on the phone. After he was connected to the desired number, the bank manager spoke. Am I talking to the Rasmussen Detective Agency? Yes, Rasmussen here, who there? Von Hartstein. Are you there yourself, Herr Rasmussen? Coincidentally yes. It sounded. I expect a telegram, which I must receive myself, so. That is excellent. I need one of your people, a trusted person. An incident which I do not wish to report by telephone, and which has just taken place in my villa during a ball, compels me to enlist your help, Herr Rasmussen. Yes, whom shall I send you? My folks are hard to get this time and only in a few hours. But I can send you someone at once. An experienced detective? The banker asked. He is very young, came the voice from the other side, but I believe the young man has a great future ahead of him. I have never met such a presence of mind, such combination ability and personal courage in someone new to the trade. All right, send it to me. When can he be here? Our cars are ready. Henry Stern can be with you in six minutes. Nice. I expect him in my private office. I will order him to be admitted at once. After the banker had given the doorman his orders by telephone, he walked up and down his office with folded hands on his back. Behind the massive forehead the thoughts of this purse king worked to find a solution to the mysterious disappearance of such a precious object. He himself did not believe the possibility, which he had expressed to his wife, that the jewel had caught on the train of one of the ladies. This long necklace, whose rare beautiful diamonds glittered like electric sparks in the light of the ballroom, this piece of so enormous value, should immediately catch the attention of all. The banker knew the people. He knew that even the rich might be tempted as to such an object, and that the ladies especially, dazzled by the splendor of the diamonds and rubies, might perform a deed which in the next instant would give her the greatest pleasure, could cause suffering. He was convinced that the necklace had slipped from his wife's beautiful neck, first into the folds of a dress, and then into the pocket of one of the beauties who was still present at the ball. He hoped, with the help of the detective, 
to find a means of regaining possession of a preciousness which, in spite of his great wealth, he was reluctant to miss. The banker looked at the clock, five minutes had passed, but the sixth was not quite gone, when there was a soft knock on his door and a slender built young man entered in impeccable public costume, a monocle in his left eye, and the cylinder with diminishing a polite bow. The visitor smiled. My name is Stern, Sir Warden, Henry Stern. You are? The deputy of the Rasmussen Detective Agency, the young man finished. Surprised, the banker asked. Is this your usual toilet, or how else could you have changed so quickly? The detective replied. A detective must be able to do anything, Herr von Hartstein, my boss told me to be with you in six minutes, and since the car could reach your house in three and a half minutes, if I counted one and a half minutes for the stairs, etc., I still had one minute to change my clothes. The banker spoke to the still young man with a certain amount of reverence for such meticulousness. I will now tell you what I need your help for. The detective bowed. An object of great value has been lost in your house, has it not? Looking surprised, the banker asked. Did your boss tell you that? The young, elegant man shook his head. That would have been impossible for Mr. Rasmussen, because he himself did not know why you had summoned me. But it wasn't hard to guess this. The suspicious looks of your servants among themselves showed me clearly that this was a case of theft, or in any case that an object of value must be missing. Valuable, because otherwise you would certainly not have called in the help of our office at night, my Lord Director. The banker nodded in agreement. You are quite right, he said, this is a necklace of diamonds and rubies, which my wife has lost. I suspect, at least, that she has lost it and that the finder or finder thinks he has not yet found any reason to return it. With a nod the detective spoke. And now I must make that person remember his duty and return the necklace? He may lose it again, said the banker, and you would be the honest finder. The detective nodded gravely. Then he said. I cannot yet believe in the courage of any of the ladies in the party to dare to wrongfully appropriate such a precious object. Are you quite sure of all your guests? As far as it is possible, most certainly, replied the banker. You know, Mr. Stern, that one cannot vouch for even one's closest relatives, let alone where there are a large number of, for the most part, superficial acquaintances. The people who live in my house usually belong to the well-known, famous families of the residents. That is why this incident strikes me all the more. By the way, the banker's voice sounded much cooler now, may I take you to the party now? The detective shook his head. It would be pleasing to me, Sir Warden, if you would go first, and if you would not bother with me. Not until later, when I turn to you again, I beg you to introduce myself to this and that. The banker nodded. As you wish. So see you again. Just a moment, please, demanded the detective. It would be my pleasure if you would give me a calling card of your own, upon which you give me power of attorney, that your subordinates obey my orders. Is that absolutely necessary? secure. In such a difficult case I cannot know what measures I should take. For everything I shall probably need a livery such as your servants wear. The banker had taken one of his large business cards from his wallet, wrote what was necessary on it with a gold fountain pen, and said, handing the card to the detective. As for the latter, you have only to turn to my steward Martin, he will be of service to you in every way. The detective bowed and the banker left. Chapter 2 the mysterious guest. After Herr von Hartstein had apologized to his playing partners for his sudden departure, he went to the banquet hall, where after some searching he found his wife. Mrs. Adelheid had already looked for her husband to share with him a remark she had made. She walked apparently gaily at his side, when, looking into a niche to her right, she said. Do you see that gentleman there, Maximilian? He is unknown to me. The banker looked unobserved in the direction indicated, and also claimed not to know this gentleman. It is possible, he whispered, that one of our guests introduced him. That would not be customary, but if there is a ball. Mrs. Adelheid shook her head. Perhaps I am a little suspicious at the moment, she said, but you should inquire, Maximilian. I will, replied her husband. Meanwhile, let me lead you to Mrs. von Blenheim, who just beckoned you. Then I will tell you what I find out. A moment later the banker's young wife was sitting next to her old friend, whom she whispered to her, 
while Monsieur von Hartstein passed through the rows of guests, looking keenly for the detective. One of the servants approached him with a silver tray full of filled glasses, and said, looking at the banker. A glass of champagne, sir? The banker looked up. A smile passed over his face, and as he took a glass from the tray, he whispered to the servant. That went quickly, Mr. Stern, I'm just looking for you. The detective, having exchanged his companion toilet for the grey livery, replied, as if by order of his master. You want to draw my attention to the gentleman yonder in that alcove, don't you, sir? I saw you a moment ago passing by with your wife. The banker did not answer, but it was difficult for him to conceal his astonishment at the almost painful attention Henry Stern showed in the matter of importance. I would like to go my own way now, continued the detective, for I suspect that this gentleman, who has already noticed me, will not be here much longer. Do you suspect him? asked the bank manager. The detective, still holding the silver tray with the champagne glasses in the same submissive position, spoke, barely moving his lips. That would be too much to say, but in any case that man does not fit in with your other guests, Sir Warden. Meanwhile the detective proceeded to offer his champagne to the other guests, and the host saw that he was rapidly approaching the door in this manner. Curious as to whether the mysterious stranger was still leaning against the marble column in the niche, the banker again directed his steps there, but he found the place empty. Immediately afterward some of his closest friends came to entangle him in a stock exchange conversation, so that for the time being he no longer thought of the stolen jewel. As he made his way back to the gaming room to continue his ombre party, he met again his wife on the arm of the beautiful, proud Englishman, whom she seemed to have chosen as her cavalier for the whole evening. A deep blush colored her cheeks when she saw her husband. This one, however, nodded to her and her cavalier with a kind smile. The Lord returned this salute with a bow of his head, and said. Your husband obviously loves you very much, Madam Baroness, even the great loss which you have caused him, be it unwillingly, does not spoil his good humor. Yes, my husband is very good, she replied, I do not remember seeing him displeased even once. You certainly don't give him any cause for it. An inquiring look from the man's dark eyes flew past the blossoming female figure. Adelheid von Hartstein was prey to the most divergent sensations when, now, without knowing where her guide was taking her, she advanced almost helplessly on his arm. A year ago, barely eighteen years old, she had followed her husband three times his age to the altar. She too was of an old noble, but impoverished family and therefore had to provide for herself. For months she had been working in one of the great offices of Herr von Hartstein, when one day the banker caught his eye. He seemed to have inquired about her, for after a while he had her called to him, and spoke in a voice that had lost all firmness. I have something to say to you, Miss von Sebald. He hesitated a moment, then went on. It is up to you whether you will grant my request. The young girl, in spite of herself, had blushed, and, after looking at her boss for a moment, had lowered her beautiful eyes, and waited with a certain dread for his further words. That which I would like to ask you concerns only myself, the banker had said. Then he was silent again. Adelheid von Sebald, blushing, had bowed her little head even more, until suddenly her chief bent down to her, took her head in his great hands, and said. I love you, Adelheid, and I wanted you to be my wife. Six weeks later they were married. Everything had gone like in a dream. The young girl, who had never met anyone who could make a deep impression on her heart, was hardly aware of the difference in years and views of life between her and her husband. Once married, this became clear to her, but her husband's endless kindness removed all that might otherwise have become an insurmountable obstacle. It had never occurred to her before seeing other men that someone else might have been a better match for her than her husband. Now, however, Adelheid von Hartstein had become restless. A sensation which confused and delighted her at the same time overcame her as she looked into the black eyes of the Englishman, which told her more than his words how deeply she, too, had made an impression on him. To distract herself, while they had settled on a couch in one of the smaller halls, she turned the conversation back to the lost necklace. My husband has already dealt with the case, she said, and I myself think I have noticed something pertaining to the case. She now gave her cavalier a description of the stranger who had noticed her and who now seemed to have disappeared. But how could that man have come near you, said Lord Brigham, 
whose aristocratic countenance spread a smile. I don't understand it either, replied Adelheid, looking thoughtfully in front of him, but I have a premonition that a further explanation might be obtained from this man. It will be difficult to determine whether that man really had anything to do with the theft. I believe that my husband has already taken the necessary steps did. He has been in contact with the detective agency for many years and they are smart, handy people. The Englishman nodded. That's the only way, at least if you've got a good desk to hand. Oh, said the young woman, the Rasmussen detective agency has a reputation of being the best and most reliable in all of Berlin. Again a smile passed over the features of the Lord, who now turned the conversation to other subjects. Meanwhile Henry Stern had followed the man who had been such a striking sight in Mrs. Adelheid's eyes. The stranger had already left the banker's hospitable house. The enigmatic man walked through the streets fairly quickly until he came across a rental car in which he took a seat. Henry Stern was still on the other side of the street, but the car barely started moving when the detective was already behind it to experience the ride in this way. It was a good thing that few people were out in the street anymore for it was an unusual sight to see a grown man hanging from a car like a real street boy. Near the Gesundbrunnen station the carriage slowed down and Henry Stern immediately jumped from the carriage to keep an eye on the carriage as he walked in the shadow of the row of houses. The car stopped in front of one of the houses, the detective saw the stranger get out, pay the coachman, open the front door and enter. Without thinking for a moment, Stern now examined the side entrances to the houses, and already in the second he found an open house door. He raced down the hall to a courtyard, where he climbed the picket fence like a cat, and when he was two hundred paces further, he repeated the same thing again. He was now in the house that interested him, but he had no idea where the stranger might be. Suddenly his eyes fell on a fairly high window, which was now lit. Here he wanted to take a look inside. Quickly resolved, as was his custom, he managed to work his way up with the aid of a carpet beater, which he found in the courtyard, until he could grip the sill of the lighted window. He had clambered up like a squirrel and now he looked into the room, where was a man wearing a blouse and looking like a workman. He was in the company of two young girls, who apparently belonged to the wretched Berlin moths. The fourth person in the room was the stranger he was pursuing. They stood together at a table and apparently watched something the stranger showed them. However, as they stood side by side, turning their backs to the detective, the latter was unable to discern what attracted the general attention. In his efforts to get a better look inside, the detective made a mistake and nearly rolled him down. However, he managed to keep his balance, but had to quickly withdraw his head and torso so as not to be seen. Inside, the sound had been heard, all had turned and looked at the window. It now seemed safer to the detective to leave his observation post. He slid down again and had just reached the picket fence over which he had just climbed, when the door leading from the house to the courtyard was opened. The detective saw that the four persons he had seen in the room were pursuing him. He heard a voice that turned on a dog and, Tyras, get him, called out. At the same instant a large dog flew madly over the place and grabbed Henry Stern, who was just about to climb over the fence, by his coat. The young detective had produced his long rubber baton and gave the dog a good blow on the snout with it, causing the animal to howl loudly. Now the two men rushed to, and Stern swung himself over the fence with a tremendous leap while a good chunk of his coat remained in the dog's mouth. The two guys apparently didn't dare to climb over the fence either. But they called after him. You won't escape us, you cursed sniffer dog. It was nearly five o'clock in the morning, Henry Stern waited a few more minutes, but when all was quiet he went out into the pitch black street. After taking note of the house number and street name, he hurried back until he found a hired carriage in a more civilized neighborhood, in which, very satisfied with his work, he had himself taken to his office. Chapter 3 In the Bedroom of the Brones I have no desire to interfere with the police in my affairs, said the banker to his wife at breakfast the next morning, when, of course, there was again much talk of the disappearance of the necklace. What use would it be? Thefts, committed in such a cunning manner, are almost never discovered by the police. I have no doubt whatsoever of the zeal and discernment of our officers, but I fear that they will accomplish little in this matter. That is why I immediately turned to Rasmussen. The young woman heard what her husband said as if in a dream. A certain thing, of which she could not account for herself, veiled all her sensations and thoughts. 
life seemed doubly pleasant to her. She found that her thoughts were elsewhere, in the presence of a tall, slender man with curly black hair and dark, glittering eyes, who again, as in the orangery yesterday, looked deeply and longingly into hers. However much effort she took to banish these thoughts, to devote herself fully to her husband again, it did not help her. Something new had come into her life, and though she would not admit it to herself, she longed for the moment when she would see and speak to him again. Later in the day, when her husband had gone to the stock exchange, she sat for a long time in her richly decorated boudoir. She asked herself repeatedly whether he, with whom her thoughts were incessantly occupied, might not have forgotten her too. When she thought of her husband again, she felt something akin to remorse. When Herr von Hartstein went out again in the evening to be present at an important meeting, he informed her before his departure that it would probably be late before he could be back. Adelheid went to bed in time, but it was a long time before she could fall asleep. At last, however, she fell asleep with a blissful smile playing on her red mouth. She dreamt. It was as if room door had been opened and soft, cautious steps approached her sumptuous bed. There he stood in the soft, subdued light of the gas crown, he of whom she had been thinking all day long. Or wasn't he? And now he even spoke to her. She did not understand him. Now called he her name, which he kept repeating in a soft, melodious voice. And now he knelt down beside her bed, stretched out his hands to her and. With a cry of terror, Adelheid von Hartstein straightened up, and with wide open eyes she gazed at the dark face of the man who knelt at the foot of her bed. In a trembling voice she asked. What do you want? Who are you? I cry for help. The nocturnal visitor raised his head, which was covered by a black velvet mask, through which only the eyes were visible, and in a voice which the young woman thought she knew, but which at the same time sounded strange to her ears, said. Do not be afraid. I will not harm you. I have come here because I must see you, by day, when everyone can see you, it is impossible for me to tell you what is in my heart. With imploringly raised hands she asked again, almost in a whisper. I do not know who you are, what do you want from me, and why do you hide your face? Art thou? But she dared not ask whether it was he who had taken her heart by storm at the ball. A soft, melodious laugh came from his lips. Whether it is I whom your heart longs for, I do not know. But I, I could not resist the invisible power that carried me to thee in this still hour. But I come for something else. Thou hast lost thy necklace at the feast, wouldst thou have it back? Surprised and speechless, the young woman stared at the nocturnal visitor, she shook her head with the curly golden hair, and with deathly pale face she panted. But who are you anyway? And what do you know of my necklace? Are you perhaps the man who leaned against the marble column in the niche? He shook his head. Ask me not who I am, for I must never answer you. Consider me an unfortunate worthy of your pity. He took her hand in his, lifted the velvet mask and pressed his lips to her glowing fingers. I don't understand, she said softly, but as she said this it was as if an inward voice whispered to her. It's him. He it is whom you love, to whom belong your heart and your senses. But, then she began to doubt again. How could the English aristocrat for a moment think of breaking into a strange house at night, coming into the bedroom of another's wife? And what did Lord Brigham have to do with the stolen necklace? But perhaps he was merely giving this up as a pretext for his unmotivated arrival? She felt, however, that she had to at least ostensibly resist this visit, and she spoke with a beating heart. Will you give me your name now? I must cry for help if you stay here any longer. As a man of honor, you must not take advantage of the helplessness of a woman. And there in that other room my husband sleeps. She did not know whether the banker was at home yet but in any case it would have been impossible for her to call for help. She did not fear this man who had invaded her bedroom and lay at her feet like a pleading boy. Hesitantly she asked. Do I know you? He answered nothing, but it seemed to her as if she heard a soft laugh from his lips. Having become more courageous, she asked again. Do you know my husband? He laughed again and whispered. I know you both, and I know why you put this question to me. Then after a short pause he continued. Perhaps I also know him of whom you are thinking. But isn't it you yourself? She asked in breathless tension. Without answering, he spoke again. Does it grieve you that you have lost your necklace? But Adelaide, filled with quite different feelings, said, shaking her head. 
After all, my husband is so rich. One does not like to lose such a thing, of course, especially him, my husband, I don't care much, have you perhaps found it? He answered nothing to this either, but kissed her hands again, which she gave him both, and then slowly stood up. It is time for me to go, but you have not seen me for the last time. And without giving Adelheid time to say anything else, the nocturnal visitor was gone. She felt numb and as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened, she quietly slumbered again. Chapter 4 The Black Letter Banker von Hartstein frothed with rage. In the morning, when he entered his office, he had found on his desk a letter in a black place setting, which had a gold monogram junior on the back. The letter was not stamped or stamped and apparently placed there by a messenger. The cover contained a typewriter letter of the following contents. Dear Sir. Don't bother trying to find out where your wife's diamond necklace is. It wouldn't help you and might put you in danger. The same applies to those to whom you may dedicate this work. It will depend on circumstances with which you have nothing to do whether the necklace will be returned to your wife. However, neither the police nor the detectives will be able to track down your operatives. John C. Raffles. Herr von Hartstein did not trust his eyes. This brutality surpassed all. Immediately the old, trusted servant Martin was called. The old man, who had already served the banker's father, appeared, as ever, immaculate in tunic and white tie, in his lord and master's office. But it was as if the man's hands trembled as he stepped on the threshold and let his white whiskers slip through his fingers. Sir commands. My dear Martin, said the banker, with a furrowed brow, I must reproach you, almost for the first time. There seem to be erroneous elements among the servants. Here, read this letter. He handed him the place setting and continued. I found this letter on my table this morning. France, the servant, claims to have no idea how it got there. May such a thing take place in a well-ordered household? The old man listened with bowed head to the words of his commander. It was as if, guiltily, he did not dare to answer. The banker continued. You know, dear Martin, what loss I suffered at the ball. Half a million is no small matter to me either. But that, moreover, I should be taunted by that villain in my own house that is the most shameful thing of all. And, dear Martin, I hold you responsible for that. The old man shrugged and said. I am very sorry, Herr von Hartstein, but I myself am powerless against all this. I have taken care of all our servants one by one after the theft, but I am convinced that none of them is capable of a dishonest act. As for the letter, however, I can personally inform you, albeit only partially, about this. The banker looked up in surprise. You? You yourself, Martin. I am very curious. With a sad smile the old man said. Yes, as my lord knows, I suffer from insomnia. Now, some time ago, for some insignificant reason, I exchanged my bedroom with the lady of the Baroness's Chamberlain. Tonight I thought I heard some noise, I turned on the electric light and saw that it was nearly 2.30. I went out of my room and saw a black figure creep past in the dim light of the hall lamp. The first moment I was paralyzed with terror, so that I neglected to rush after him, and after that, in spite of all my efforts, I could not find his trail. However, I was not at ease, and about half an hour later I began to search again. As I pass Madame Baroness' bedroom, the door to the corridor is opened, and a tall figure, dressed in black, emerges inaudibly. The old man was silent and looked in alarm at his master's pale face. In a tone of indignation, von Hartstein asked. Have you seen the man's face? That was impossible for me. He wore a mask, or rather a black velvet headgear, through which only the eyes were visible. And you let him go? The banker asked, taking a deep breath. That just makes me so unhappy, said old Martin, wringing his hands. I was paralyzed with terror by that ghostly figure. I couldn't even make a sound. The strange, otherworldly apparition glided silently past me, its penetrating eyes fixed on me. When I had recovered from the terror, the mysterious man was gone. To the frame of one of the windows close to the stairs I found a silk cord fastened, along which the criminal probably slipped down. The banker answered nothing. He had sat down at his desk and was deep in thought. He no longer thought of the impudent letter in the black place setting, even the loss of the necklace was indifferent to him for the moment, only the thought of his wife occupied his mind. 
Hitherto it had never occurred to him that his wife's pure, blue eyes could look longingly at other men. How was it that a feeling of doubt now suddenly seized the already aged man's heart? Was it not unworthy of him, in the impudent conduct of a rogue, who had perhaps been in his wife's chambers while he slept, to seek disloyalty from the beloved being? But, this wasn't all. Adelaide's attitude had changed so completely after the night of the ball. Sweet and friendly as ever, she had become introverted and silent. What could this man mean in his letter with the circumstances with which he himself had nothing to do and on which it would depend whether the stolen necklace would be returned to Adelheide? All these questions pained the banker terribly. At last he lifted his head and said, looking at the old servant with a good smile. Thank you, dear Martin, would you be so kind as to let the chambermaid tell my wife that I wish to speak to her in fifteen minutes? Martin withdrew and returned shortly afterwards with the announcement that Madame the Baroness had just risen and was expecting Monsieur the banker in a quarter of an hour. Chapter 5 A Heart Secret Adelheid had awakened late from her dreams at first. However, when her chambermaid opened the curtains and full, bright daylight entered the more than sumptuous bedroom, all the visions of the night were gone. She found herself again in her villa as the wife of the famous stock market king and millionaire von Hartstein, she was the rich, distinguished woman who had sworn allegiance to her husband and who, now that sobriety had worked again, was determined to avoid all other feelings. Irrevocably banished from her heart. Was it real, her dream of that night? But why hadn't she cried for help when the stranger knelt by her bed? How could she have imagined for a moment that the English aristocrat and the burglar, the same one who had stolen her necklace, had anything to do with each other. Would Lord Brigham, a peer of England, invade a strange house at night to pay homage to a lady? No. She wished she could appear before her husband and tell him who had had the sad courage to come into her bedroom. But that was impossible. She knew his suspicion and jealousy, and knew that he would not believe her if she told him the course of the nighttime adventure. And because she did not have the courage to tell him everything, she resolved to remain silent. At this moment she received a message from her husband that he wished to see her. She understood that this early conversation was connected with what had happened in the night, and she waited anxiously for her husband's arrival. When he entered, she saw by his closed lips that his temper was not the best, but she had had time to prepare air and so was outwardly calm and quiet. After the banker had let her read the letter in the black cover, she seemed as indignant at this as he himself, and replied to his question whether she had noticed anything of the villain's presence. But Max, you understand that I would have shaken up the whole house. I would have died of fear. These words reassured him completely. The certainty that his wife's heart was as pure and innocent as ever made him forget all anxiety, and Adelheid did her best to prove to him that she loved him more than ever and thought of no other man. With the blonde head on his broad chest she looked up at him tenderly. Patiently she allowed herself to be kissed on the mouth and eyes, until, looking at the clock, he saw that it was high time to go to the stock exchange. The young woman made her way to her boudoir, where she returned to her thoughts. Would she tell her husband everything? But no, he wouldn't understand her, he couldn't. There was only one in all the world who could help her. Only one, in whose chivalry she trusted utterly. That one was Lord Brigham. If the audacious stranger should trouble her again, she would go to him, to the English nobleman, from whose friendship she expected salvation. Strengthened by this resolve, she called her maid to be dressed for a riding tour. Chapter 6 In the Dance House Henry Stern had just left the millionaire's villa, not very excited about what he should have learned there. The banker had shown him the black letter and added that if he did not see at least the beginnings of some result within a few days, he would hand the matter over to another detective agency. That was like a slap in the face to the young man. Though he was only twenty-three years old, he considered himself, and perhaps not unjustly, to be a genius at his trade. Herr von Hartstein, Stern thought, was demanding a bit much. Not more than four days had elapsed since the ball in the villa and this time was almost too short to track down such a cunning criminal. Henry Stern had a lead, after all, which he had communicated to the millionaire, but it had so far led to nothing. Already in the morning, following the night in question, he had returned to the house where the car had taken him. He found the house without any difficulty. There lived an old woman, a type such as one finds her more in the criminal quarters of the big cities. She rented out her rooms for a few days or nights 
as asked, but the old man claimed to know nothing of the matter. All night, she said, there had been no light in her house, and no one had been there but herself. The detective must have been mistaken. He probably meant another house down the street. Stern was not allowed to enlist the help of the police, as Herr von Hartstein had strictly forbidden him to do so. He had to comply with this prohibition, although in this very case the help of the police had been of great value to him. Sighing and dissatisfied with himself, Henry Stern was now on his way to Mr. Rasmussen, to tell him, as was his duty, what he had learned at the villa that morning, when a gentleman approached him with outstretched hands. Henry, old boy, how are you? The detective immediately recognized his former school comrade Peter Bocher, and soon they were engaged in a lively conversation, which, at the suggestion of the friend, they continued in a wine restaurant. Henry Stern told how he had originally intended to become an officer, but that a very unpleasant dual history, which he had been unable to prevent, had made his career in the army impossible. By accident he had become a detective, a profession for which he seemed really born. That's a coincidence, replied the other, then we got pretty much the same occupation after all. I studied law and ended up becoming a police commissioner. Here in Berlin? Stern asked, pleasantly surprised. The other nodded in agreement and continued. I know what you want to say, and I will answer your question at once, if it is in any way possible for me, without neglecting my duty, I will gladly assist you in every way. Shortly afterwards, the two friends drove together in a rental car to the police headquarters. And after the commissioner Bocher there very formally introduced his friend to the chief of the detectives, the latter kindly gave permission to leave through the criminal album. Henry Stern confided in this gentleman why it was his business. After this the commissioner led the detective into a room which contained the so-called criminal album. It was an elongated room with countless compartments and shelves on the walls, containing stacks of photographs. All these statues were neatly arranged according to age, hair color, size, and the like markings of the criminals. Henry Stern's aim was to find the portrait of the man who had stood in the niche in the millionaire's villa on the ball night, leaning against the marble column, and whom he had later followed into the courtyard of the accused house. For some time his research was fruitless. At last the officer brought a package of newly arrived photographs representing persons who had first been photographed briefly in Berlin or elsewhere when leaving penitentiary institutions. Looking at these portraits, Stern hurriedly reached for one of the photographs, saying that. But he had his beard removed. Turning the photograph over, the commissioner read. Adolf Muller, of Miss Lowitz, surnamed Silesian Adolf, born July 23, 1869 repeatedly punished for aggravated theft and robbery. That's him, said Henry Stern, if only I could explain how the man came into possession of the necklace. For if, in any case, he did gain entrance to the villa, the Baroness would by no means have danced with him, for he had not even been introduced to her. And that he would have passed her just at the moment when she lost the necklace, she missed it after a quadrille, is not to be assumed either. The other officers shrugged and Peter Bocher said, Yes, fellow, those are the riddles you must solve. In any case, I'm very grateful to you and the other gentlemen for giving me insight into these things, said Stern, for at least I now somewhat know who I am dealing with. We too will keep an eye on Herr Adolf Muller, assured the commissioner. Henry Stern took his leave and at once followed the advice given to him by one of the gentlemen at the police station, namely to visit a small restaurant on Sadel Street, the Tip Cafe, as it was called by the visitors. The police often had reason to keep an eye on this restaurant, because of the frequent gatherings of criminals and vagabonds, and because, although the owner was often punished, there was a lot of play. In the afternoon of the same day a gentleman with small English whiskers appeared in the Café Sosler, as it was officially called, and who also betrayed the bourgeois Englishman by his dress and whole demeanor. He ordered in a slow tone, speaking with a real English accent, first a glass of beer and, as he could not get it, a glass of port. He emptied his glass with apparent pleasure. He then picked up a sports magazine and delved into its contents, blowing thick clouds of smoke from a short tobacco pipe. He sat thus for an hour, and then another hour, without taking off his jockey cap. Even when two people entered the otherwise empty tip cafe, he did not look up from the magazine, which apparently interested him very much. 
the two very elegantly dressed gentlemen entered the café, which was always quite dark during the day, and spoke for a while at the buffet with the waiter who was staying there. Then they apparently wanted to leave the room again, when the smaller of the two, a man with a black moustache and modest appearance, spoke. Say, we could have a glass of lager first. They took their seats in the immediate vicinity of the Englishman and began to speak of a party which they had apparently witnessed the previous evening. The Englishman, hiding behind his leaf, didn't turn an eye from them. He immediately had in one the Silesian Adolf recognized, and in the same instant was determined not to lose sight of him again. This was not so easy now, in broad daylight, but Henry Stern felt that his reputation as a detective was at stake. He now paid and asked the waiter something in broken, mixed with English, German, which he did not understand. He had the satisfaction that the smaller of his two neighbors translated his words. As a result, he came into conversation with them and told them that he was a stranger in Berlin. He had come for the races, and because he liked Berlin so much, he wanted to stay a few more days. But to his regret he didn't know anyone who could show him around the city, and there was so much to see. The detective masterfully mastered the art of pretending to be stupid and at once noticed that the two gentlemen were looking at each other meaningfully during his story. We are a couple of real Berliners, said Silesian Adolf, and it would be our pleasure to show you how we are. Yes, interrupted the other, we've been down since yesterday and just in the right mood. If you want to join us, see. If a man has money in Berlin, he can make the devil dance. Well, said the Englishman, I will do that and I also thank you for taking me with you. Oh, that doesn't mean anything, replied the little one, who introduced himself as Fritz von Beer, that's the Christian duty to show a foreigner a little. Come on, let's take a carriage and go out. Soon the three were in a car to visit the various bars and cafes of Friedrichstrasse. Henry Stern soon realized that his comrade's aim was to get him drunk. But he could endure quite a lot and besides that he only took fairly innocent things. Salesian Adolf seemed more and more pleased with the presence of the new acquaintance. In the meantime evening had come and Adolf suggested that we go and see something very interesting, a piece of the real dark Berlin. I know a dance house, he said, you have never seen such a thing in all your life, Mr. Silvers. Under this name the detective had introduced himself to the two villains. You can see the worst criminals in Berlin there, as you otherwise only see them in sensational novels. There is nothing more interesting. Henry Stern didn't think twice. He was carrying a dagger and a pistol loaded with seven rounds. In addition, he was not only strong, but also extremely agile. And what was more valuable was the unparalleled courage he displayed in all circumstances. The car was now passing through roughly the same neighborhoods as it had made Henry's late nighttime drive less easy. At last the carriage came to a halt before a building above the entrance of which hung a large illuminated balloon bearing the name Moore and Polly. May legible. Actually it's called the pan, remarked Adolf. And you shall see in a moment what is being cooked in that pan, sir. Through the door one first entered a less favored cafe, where it was stuffy and cold. Here a great number of expired subjects, with their ladies of dubious sort, feasted on large glasses of beer and spirits. Then they entered a narrow passage which led to a large cellar. This room, which the three men now entered, had a low ceiling, and someone of normal height had to be careful not to bump his head against the large kerosene lamps that hung from the ceiling. This ballroom was about ten meters long and six wide. A laughing, screaming crowd danced frantically to the tones of the savage music. A disgusting odor of alcohol, smoke, and human exhalation filled the room, and the whole thing gave the impression of a gigantic cauldron in which human passions and vices are constantly boiling. Here below the foam of the population of the giant city was gathered. The girls were partly clad in rags, partly decorated like a peacock. The men wore filthy smocks, in which they had worked for a long time, or good clothes, which were most certainly not lawfully obtained. Henry Stern had witnessed many savage scenes in his life, his profession, though as a spectator, brought him into contact with such conditions but here he was nevertheless filled with disgust. His two conductors, apparently not much better than the dancers, the numerous greetings and nods of understanding from the various ranks of the girls and men proved that, they both kept the detective in their midst. And Henry Stern understood that the visit to the pan would not be of an innocent nature. He reached into his pocket for his pistol. 
At this moment another stream of visitors burst into the door behind them, and Stern noticed that Silesian Adolf turned beside him and signaled someone. Almost simultaneously the detective received a tremendous thrust in the back, so that he was thrown against the dancing couples. He was hurled back, and without succeeding in getting back on his feet, he flew back and forth between the fists of the guests. The women screamed, some men roared, others laughed, and vile invectives rang out. The detective understood that this was a plot against him. And when he now heard cries like, cursed scoundrel, and police spy, he no longer doubted that Silesian Adolf had recognized him and betrayed him to his comrades, nay, even deliberately lured him here. This vile scoundrel was clever enough not to lynch his foe himself, but to leave this vengeance to the whole company, who were celebrating their savage banquet in this dance cellar. Kicked, beaten and almost mad with rage and pain, Henry Stern finally managed to reach one of the walls, where he grabbed a chair and threatened to knock down anyone who dared approach him. But now his assailants first came loose in all their roughness. The knives were taken out, and in a close throng they approached the young man, who now had no choice but to take out his revolver and shout to the ever-urging mob. Stop. Whoever takes one more step is a child of death. For an instant the party retreated, fearing a fatal shot from the weapon, but immediately the rears pushed forward again, the roar doubled, and when the first shot, which Henry Stern aimed over the heads of his attackers, three flew at him at once, knocked the gun out of his hand, which went off again, but no one hit, and dragged him to the ground. The detective thought that this would be his last moment. Only the fact that he had so many attackers and one pushing the other away saved him for the moment. Despite all this, he did not give up yet. He had grabbed one of the fellows by the throat and pulled it towards him, in order to have a shield for the time being. But he clearly felt that this help, too, would be short-lived. Now someone with enormous strength tore his hands free, a whole mob attacked him. In this moment of utmost distress a shrill whistle sounded suddenly through the subterranean hall. The crowd flew apart, those who held him, beat him and kicked him, all turned away from him at once. And when, finally freed, he managed to get up on his knees, he saw that policemen had entered the room from two sides at the same time and that, therefore, miraculously, rescue had arrived for him at the last moment. Panting and with great difficulty he rose and, clinging to the wall, reached a chair on which he fell, bruised and bruised and in great pain. Some of the thugs seemed to have escaped, and several police officers were busy capturing some individuals whom they had long sought. To his unspeakable joy the detective found that both Silesian Adolf and his little friend were among them. Now a large, corpulent police officer approached, and Henry recognized with the last remnant of his consciousness his old friend, the Commissaire Bocher, who had ordered this raid, in the hope of finding his friend here and maybe be able to help. Chapter 7 The Millionary Club It was the afternoon when the gentlemen were sitting in their comfortable armchairs in the smoking room of the Millionaire's Club enjoying their mocha, liquor and fine cigars. One of the gentlemen, who had the appearance of a bon vivant and player, was talking to someone of rare beauty, of a sympathetic appearance. He ran his slender white fingers against his black moustache and was just telling an anecdote when an attendant of the club came in and reported that Lord Brigham was asked to speak to the telephone. The approximately thirty-year-old gentleman stood up with an elastic movement and followed the servant to the telephone. The Lord raised the telephone to his ear and cried in his pleasant, melodious voice. Hello, who's there? He had to wait a few moments, then, smiling, he heard a deliberately altered female voice speak. May I ask for Lord Brigham's address? I'm on the plane myself, he replied, and I live at 68 Victoria Street, first floor. And when can my Lord speak? As a counter question it sounded. With whom do I have the honor? You were requested not to inquire about this for the time being. Your lordship can do a lady a great service, if you will attend to her for a few minutes as soon as possible. I'll be at my house in ten minutes. Oh, thank you. The telephone bell rang and Lord Brigham went to the cloakroom, where the servant helped him with his overcoat and handed him the cylinder and cane. He mounted his car, which was waiting for him outside the building, and in less time than he had stated the Lord was in the Indian decorated room, which served him as a reception room. The floor here was covered with mats and the walls were covered with the rare embroidery that comes from Madras. The furniture, made of gilded bamboo, all gave the impression of grace and elegance. 
Over the windows hung precious muslin curtains decorated with strange golden figures. This gave the whole room something magical, especially because of the soft, subdued light. There was a call. The entering servant, dressed as an English jockey, presented a lady. I beg you to be let in, said the Lord. Immediately afterwards Mrs. Adelheid von Hartstein entered the Indies drawing room, pulling back the closed veil and showing her face, blushing with embarrassment. Lord Brigham went to meet her with outstretched hands and said. My dear madam, what gives me the great honor and unspeakable pleasure of seeing you with me? Tears welled up in her beautiful blue eyes. I pray you, he said softly, as he led the young woman to a couch, keep calm, madam. For whatever reason you have come here, if it is in my power, I will gladly help you, I assure you. She nodded softly at him, weeping, and said at last with a deep sigh. It is certainly foolish that I should turn to you. I don't know why I put so much confidence in you. She lowered her eyes, and a dark blush covered her face and neck. He looked at her with a wistful smile and thereupon encouraged her to inform him of her concerns, that he might, if possible, alleviate them. Now she began to tell of that night, when half asleep she had seen a male figure before her bed, how she had previously disregarded that appearance and, she whispered almost inaudibly, had thought of someone else. The white hand of the man opposite her softly caressed her bowed head, and then, when she raised her deep blue eyes to him, he asked softly and urgently. May I also know who it was whom you thought you saw before you that night? She didn't answer. But her charming shyness, her silence, and passionately trembling lips told him enough. He bowed his head sadly, for a moment it was as if he wanted to take her in his arms and press her to his breast, then with trembling lips he whispered softly and sadly. Madam, you are married and I have no right to tear you away from the man who gives you a sunny life. I come and go, and may not bind a woman's fate to mine. She looked up at him with moist eyes. She had perhaps not thought of leaving her husband, but it sounded so strange to her. You don't know who I am. But before she could think any more about this, he bade her tell him what made her so anxious. Oh, that was soon said. The man who had stood in the alcove at the ball and who was doubtless the thief of her necklace, filled her with such terror. He had certainly been the one who had forced her way into her bedroom at night, perhaps because he had hoped to steal even more. And this morning her husband had informed her that that man had been caught, that he had already been brought to justice. If only he told that he had been in Baroness von Hartstein's bedroom that night, that he had knelt before her bed and kissed her hands. She had not dared tell her husband this. Her only excuse was that in the figure of the burglar she had thought she saw the image of the man she loved, and she had not dared admit this to her husband. As Adelheid told this, her tears kept flowing. Then, however, he spoke with a secret joy which she did not understand. Fear nothing. Though I cannot explain everything to you, yet you can believe my words. The man you saw standing in your ballroom at that time was not the same who visited you at night. He will not prepare you any unpleasantness, for he does not know you and hardly suspects your existence. I repeat to you once more, that you can go to sleep peacefully and carefree, no one but your own mouth can betray you. She looked at him with astonished eyes. But how? Why? With a soft smile he said. You mustn't ask me anything, if only because it pains me infinitely to not have to answer you. First of all I would like you to think of me in friendship after we have parted. Are you going? When? Or am I not allowed to know that too? She asked anxiously. I don't know myself at the moment. I am like a bird that soars into the air and flees from the hand that stretches out to hold it. The twilight descended upon the earth, shrouding the room in fairy tale shadows. It had become quiet in the oriental drawing room. Chapter 8 The Robbery Questioned by the police, Silesian Adolf had refused any explanation. He claimed with imperturbable calm that he was conscious of no wrong and did not understand what the lords wanted of him. He politely requested to be returned to his cell because he was tired and wanted to sleep. Some time later he was again interrogated by Commissioner Bocher. But even now without any result. Apparently they were dealing here with a very inveterate villain, who was not easily compelled to speak. Henry Stern was present at this interrogation, smiling and letting the criminal's angry looks pass by. The day after the incident at the dance house, the banker von Hartstein had personally visited the young detective at his home, 
even sent him his own doctor and gave him a considerable sum as additional reward. I fully appreciate what you have done for me, he said to the patient. If a man like you puts his life on the line for the sake of those who pay him, he is a man of duty deserving of all esteem. Henry Stern was very pleased at these words, he could also use the money, and with redoubled zeal, barely recovered and with his head bandaged, he took up the business again. When the criminal had been taken away again, he said to Peter Bocher. They'll have to catch the other fellow, who unfortunately escaped, and find the two women who were in their company at night when I watched them. Very well, said the commissioner, but it won't be so easy. At this moment a terrible scream was heard in the corridor outside. The commissioner went out and, when he came back, said. It means nothing. The officers took a note from a guy who was just brought in. Can I see it? asked Henry Stern with interest. The commissioner handed him the torn piece of paper and the detective read. Watch Hull. Noble threesome from this off. The other officers also read it and laughed. Nobody understood the content. Finally, Stern, who had also acquainted himself theoretically with his profession, spoke. Do you know what this means, gentlemen? No, said Peter Bocher, do you know? The detective nodded. Secure. These words mean nothing more or less than that one who is to be transferred from here to the penitentiary should keep an eye out for the cave, meaning Moabit, because they're the noble trio, that is, of course, three of his comrades, on waiting for him, who will take him out of the couch, that is to say out of misery, that is, will set him free. It is a pity that we do not know to whom this letter is addressed. Oh! thought Butcher, that could be found out. We will see where the bearer of the note is now. Already he had gone out, and after a few minutes he returned with a tall, lanky young man, who had been nicked for willful insult and inconvenience. It looks like, whispered the commissioner to his friends, as if this rascal, who already owns a good rogue, let himself be picked up only to deliver this note. I believe it is best that we pretend that we cannot decipher the note, and want to know from him what the words mean. He turned to the boy and asked such a question. This one grinned and spoke. Oh, that's just a joke. I just wrote it down like that, for the joke. The officer did not reply to this, but asked, suddenly assuming a very polite tone. Have you had breakfast yet? The addressee was startled. These words, in the conversation of the police officers with the crooks, mean that the unwilling criminal will be given a good beating by the firm fists of the policeman. I'm not going to be thundered cried the boy in a half-crying voice. You cannot do that. The commissioner said with a laugh. What we may or may not do, we shall know best ourselves. I will, replied the young man, you want me to be sneezed? What is in that note, I will not tell you. Now, think about it again. At least you can strengthen yourself first. One of the policemen brought in a few thick sandwiches at the command of his superior, whereupon the lanky attacked like a hungry wolf. Thereupon he was deliberately led into the defendant's quarters, where a large number of persons who had been taken captive and had to undergo their first interrogation were gathered. Ten minutes later, another person was admitted into this large, bare room, who in appearance appeared to belong to the assembled elements, but who was in fact a police officer. When this man was taken away half an hour later, he was fully aware. The young man had at once asked him for paper and pencil and, when he was in possession of them, had written a new note. Thereupon he had inquired in a cunning but unequivocal manner about Silesian Adolf, who apparently had to receive the note. Henry Stern and the commissioner deliberated how to proceed with this matter. Adolf was to be transferred to Moabit that very afternoon, and, said the commissioner, I don't suppose at all where the fellows will try to free their comrade. They are counting on it, continued Peter Bocher that we prefer not to transport serious criminals to Moabit in the prison wagon, but in a carriage, accompanied by a few trusted men. And we will not deviate from this custom even today. An hour later the prisoner Adolf Muller was actually transported. But first another carriage departed, in which Peter Bocher, the detective, and also two hugely built police officers were seated. As the carriage in which Silesian Adolf stopped in Lietestrasse before the small entrance to the Muabita Cellular Prison, a group of men in work smocks, who seemed to be coming from their labours, happened to come round the corner. They sauntered toward the carriage, smoking and talking, from which the first policeman had just emerged. One of the workers, stammering as if he were drunk, asked. 
Who are you bringing there, little man? Oh, what a beautiful boy. Meanwhile, the criminal, shackled with a steel chain, climbed out of the carriage. He glanced around at lightning speed and immediately had an overview of the situation. At this moment two girls approached in large, feathered hats, in silk frocks, and with powdered faces. You won't suffer them to put your friend in jail, will you? Make sure their helmets fly away. And at the same time she was already hitting the policeman with her umbrella. He was on duty to repel the blows that were now in quick succession, and was about to draw his saber when the five workers forcefully pushed the two officers away and closed the prisoner in a circle. They pushed him along some way, then he started to run as fast as he could. A hundred paces further was another carriage, apparently waiting for someone. But before the criminal's comrades and this himself could mount the carriage to get away while driving, another carriage pulled up from which two uniformed officers, Commissioner Butcher and the detective, jumped. The two other policemen who had freed themselves from their assailants with great effort also rushed up. Furious, knives in hand, Silesia and Adolf's henchmen threw themselves at the officers. Adolf himself punched and kicked around madly. Now the commissary ordered the swords to be drawn, and this immediately put an end to the battle. One of the attackers fell wounded, a few fled screaming and the others surrendered in mercy or disgrace. The officers had the most trouble with the prisoner, who bit and kicked like a devil. At last they threw him, cuffed hand and foot, into the carriage. One of the two women, who had escaped together, had lost a purse on her flight, which Henry Stern opened and from which he took out a pocket calendar with her address. Drums, said Butcher, laughing, I think she is an old, good acquaintance of ours. The best thing is that we send the agents with the transport to the headquarters and go out to investigate this woman person ourselves. Salesian Adolf and his also handcuffed accomplices were now caught in both carriages, escorted by the officers while the commissioner and Stern took another carriage. They drove to Golnau Street, where the girl, who was apparently the bride of Silesian Adolf, lived. They hadn't even gotten that far when Henry Stern, looking by chance, saw the two women coming out of a small pastry shop. Watch out, said Bocher, I will now get out behind her, you drive a little further and then walk towards her. That way they can't escape us. A few minutes later, the two women sat with her unwanted cavaliers in a closed carriage, which took them together to Alexander Pline. Already on the way the one who did everything in his power to be released again gave away the matter. She told in detail how the plan to free Silesian Adolf had proceeded from her mate, the Black Rosa, who was the criminal's bride. Now the two men had worked to stop the burglar's sweetheart, who flew at her friend like fury. The other betrayed even more in her anger. You can say whatever you want. He had the necklace with us, in the Boomstra. The two friends exchanged a quick glance of understanding. Where did he get that necklace? asked Peter Bocher. From some earl, the girl replied. Maybe he still has the thing in his house. Where does Adolf Muller live? But before the girl could answer, her friend pounced on her. A savage fight now unfolded in the carriage. The shards of glass flew into the street, the coachman stopped the horses, and a great crowd gathered around the carriage. There was nothing left but for each of the two men to get into a carriage with one of the girls and ride to the police station. The detective was accompanied by the badly beaten girlfriend of the Black Rosa. He had agreed with the commissioner that he would give the girl her freedom as soon as he had received the address of Adolf's house from her. And this didn't last long, the carriage stopped, the girl ran away, and the detective rode to the northern part of the town. There, near the dance house, where he had had such bitter experiences, was the dwelling of Silesian Adolf. He lived there with a woman who made a very unfavorable impression and simply denied ever having seen Adolf. She wanted to prevent Stern from entering the house. The latter, however, simply pushed her aside, saying that if she made any further objections, she would also be imprisoned. In the meantime Bocher also appeared, who had received a telephone message from Stern. The two friends had to search for a long time before they found that which particularly interested them in the house of Silesian Adolf. It was true that at once several objects of value fell into their hands, which must have come from minor or major thefts, but the diamond necklace was not to be found, nor was there any trace of this theft. Coincidentally, Henry Stern, whose detective's eye was looking everywhere, 
saw in an ashtray a multitude of cigarette dips. They were all without mouthpieces, except one with a long mouthpiece, on which in gold letters C, D, M and a golden crown were printed. A little further on was the name of the firm C, called Aropulos, Berlin W. With a sweet smile, Stern picked up the roll of paper and showed it to his friend. He immediately understood that the riddle had now been solved. Salesian Adolf had been the tool of another. Half an hour later the carriage with the two police officers stopped in front of the cigarette shop of a Greek, who informed them at their inquiries that this type of cigarette was manufactured exclusively for the Club of the Millionaires. Chapter 9 The Power of Love Baron von Hartstein was just sitting with his wife at dinner when the servant brought in a ticket. Glancing at the name, he said, pleasantly surprised. Send the gentleman to my private office at once. Is it such a momentous visit, Maximilian? His wife asked in surprise. Certainly, replied the millionaire, and left the room. Fifteen minutes later he returned in rare excitement. Without knowing why, Adelheid had a feeling as if something terrible was about to happen, and of late, despite Lord Brigham's reassuring assurances, she had felt perpetually nervous and anxious. Her husband had returned to the table and continued to stare into deep thought. At last the young woman asked in a timid tone. What is it, Maximilian? You frighten me by your attitude. It is almost unbelievable, replied the banker. What then? Tell me anyway. She begged. The banker shook his head, grunted something in his grey moustache, and seemed to be thinking seriously again. Finally he spoke. It's impossible. It's not possible. And again after a pause. Those folks. Hmm. Hmm. Those detective and commissioner. They believe. Again he was silent. No. 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 It's too ridiculous. It is an exaggerated raid by the police. More and more anxious and almost weeping Adelheid asked. But I don't understand you. You speak so vaguely. What then is impossible? Do these gentlemen suspect someone who, who interests us? As she asked this, the young woman already suspected everything. Combining everything that had happened in her bedroom since that night, she had developed a premonition that she wanted to get rid of it with all her strength. She dared not give full account of her thoughts, but she knew beforehand what her husband would now tell her. And so she wasn't as surprised as he had just been. The two gentlemen suspect, he said, that the thief of your necklace is one of the millionaire's club members. Who, they have not yet discovered that themselves. They asked me if I suspected anyone, of course I couldn't say the least, I believe it is a mistake, and have advised them to proceed as carefully as possible. It was the young woman as if suddenly all her blood had turned to ice, an unnatural calm had taken hold of her. She now knew who had stolen the necklace from her. But not a single thought of wrath crossed her mind. She did not ask why he had acted in this way. She did not consider that he was a criminal, that he did not fit into the circles in which he moved, and in which he was such a sympathetic appearance. You remain remarkably calm, noted the banker. She smiled. Thereupon she spoke in an indifferent tone. So much unheard of is happening that there is no need to be surprised any more. Well, it's good that you take it calmly, said von Hartstein, but it proves that you women have stronger nerves than we do. And now you must excuse me, I have a momentous meeting. Oh, how gladly she excused him. He had scarcely left the room when she, too, had her maid dress her before going out. She tied a closed, almost opaque veil around her hat and left the villa on foot. In another street she took an automobile, in which she was taken to a remote part of the city. She then rode a tram for a while and then walked a further part of her way. At last she took another hired car and drove to the street in which she lived. She covered the last stretch, to his house, on foot. She hastened up the stairs, and was very happy when the dignified servant informed her that his master was at home. She entered the room where he was, and now the words flowed from her lips. You are being persecuted. They are on your trail. They know everything. You must leave. At once, as soon as possible. Scarcely startled, he looked at her for a few moments with his sensible, wonderful eyes. Then he went to his writing desk, opened one of the compartments and took out the diamond necklace. A flush of joy colored her cheeks, but then she again urged him to hasten. He shook his head with a smile. I stay, he replied. 
I don't even know if those ignorant fellows have so much brains as to invent the club member they seek. I am not accustomed to go until I see the great necessity of it. But you, poor woman, you must get out of here. I hope we will meet again one day. The young woman raised her handkerchief to her eyes as she departed, and a determined expression lay about her mouth. She slipped the necklace into her pocket and crept like a shadow through the quiet streets of that part of town. So she came to the zoo, and when she reached the dark, murky water, her hand slipped into the pocket of her dress. No one was around her. In the parting light of the day something glistened and twinkled, that was the diamond necklace, which she tossed into the deep dark lake. Chapter 10 the Lord is going. In the Millionaire's Club there was the greatest dismay. For it had become known to the gentleman through the steward that the police suspected a criminal among the club members and were looking for him. It is almost unbelievable what stupidity the police are sometimes capable of, said the little Viscount von Henkar. And Count Steinach, the president of the Millionaire's Club added. Frankly, the detectives have a far from easy task. But, isn't it? One must surely ascribe to them so much discernment that they must be able to sift, properly segregate. I mean, I think, that they must surely take into account rank, with rank, with, with, uh, uh, well, to put it that way, they must surely think of the moral weight of the personalities whom we judge worthy of being admitted as club members, a, a, I mean, I think, that ought to be surety enough for the lords of the police, more than warrant enough that had to convince them at all times that everything is clean here. A, 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 what a crazy idea is that, a preposterous idea, one of our club mates. We have twenty gentlemen in our club, or twenty-one, ah, uh, ah, uh, how many are there exactly, I'm not too sure, well, that's easy to count, and if one of those twenty, or twenty-one, even the tiniest nitty-gritty, ah, uh, ah, uh, I mean, I mean, if by his character, if he's just a snippet, a shred would give offence. The Earl laid both hands on the heavy oak table with a most weighty gesture and leaned forward a little way. Then he started again. Yes, gentlemen, I think we must stand up with all our strength against this unheard of and, in my opinion, also illegal act of the police to intrude upon us unsolicited. I propose to prevent such action in a courteous but energetic manner. And in addition, we should know for ourselves if there were an inferior among us. At the same instant the youngest of the four board members, Lord Brigham, entered. He was recently elected a board member. In a lively tone he apologized that he had been a little late and could only come to the hastily convened meeting now. When he heard what was spoken of, he said with a smile that gave his countenance an extraordinary attractiveness. But gentlemen, the matter is very simple. You know what? We simply have to line up in a long line and then march past the masters of the police. They can then decide together which of us looks the most suspicious. There was a hearty laughter at this amusing outburst of the young lord. After a long time of reasoning about the course of action to be followed in this regard, it was decided to send a letter to the chief of police. This letter would be signed by all club members and its contents would include a request that the Millionaire's Club be excused from such visitation in the future. After that the gentlemen withdrew in small groups into the cosy rooms and the time was passed with some game or with pleasant chatter. The unsavory thing was no longer thought of. It was about half past seven. Lord Brigham, accompanied by Count Steinach and Viscount von Henkar, left the club to ride to the opera. When they had just left the building, a gentleman in civil approached them, who identified himself as the police commissioner. In the most courteous tone he asked which of the three club members was Lord Brigham. With an almost inaudible laugh, the Lord made himself known and established his identity. The other two gentlemen were very excited. In a loud, urgent tone they declared that they vouched for their clubmate at all times. Detective Chief Peter Bocher, his colleague Henry Stern was waiting across the street and watching, was beginning to hesitate. Hitherto the police had only learned from telegraphic information on all sides that a certain Lord Brigham did indeed exist. It was also added, however, that this same Lord was an officer in an Indian regiment of hussars in the service of the King of Great Britain. The English police authorities were, furthermore, of the general opinion that, taking into account the description of this man, it was most probable that this was dealing with an extremely cunning thief and swindler, one who had made a name for himself in both Australia and Bombay, who had many villains on his conscience, but who, 
despite all efforts, had not yet been caught by the police. That all sounded really nice. It even knocked like a bus. But, it was by no means certain. And though Peter Bocher also had the warrant for his arrest in his pocket, he still didn't dare act. He knew that he had to exercise the utmost caution with regard to this club, which had been so highly regarded in the highest ranks. And if anyone was to be taken into custody, oh, it had to be done in the most delicate, least publicizing way. To take all this into account was a very difficult task for the best brave Bocher. He could easily burn his fingers at this affair. The police are also sometimes mistaken, sometimes fall into a trap, is sometimes just once led around the garden. What if the London police had been less correctly informed? Or what if that particular Lord Brigham, who was an officer to His Majesty the King of Great Britain, had now been granted longer leave, which he spent here in Berlin? That would be a miserable story, after all, to pick up and arrest this man, for whom such distinguished figures stood surety, just like the first criminal. No. Bocher could kick his nose way too badly and blame himself in a way that you don't easily think of. He could throw his whole career to the moon with it. Weren't there always and everywhere jealous colleagues waiting for someone to fall from grace? Until someone had made themselves impossible by some clumsiness and had to resign fairly or, demoted or not honorably discharged? All devils. Bocher was dizzy for a moment. All sorts of conflicting thoughts whirled through his brain and it was as if colorful lights were beginning to flicker before his eyes. It buzzed in his ears and his heart pounded heavily in his throat. What was he supposed to do? What the hell? Does the commissioner doubt my rank as lord? The Englishman asked this in a melodious, engaging tone. Then I'll gladly the English accent sounded clearer than ever at these words, then I'd like, if only to further safeguard the club from all possible unpleasantness and investigations, to do the commissioner the pleasure of giving him the to show official papers proving the authenticity of my nobility, of my lordship. If my most esteemed friends he bowed gracefully to his clubmates, would accompany me on this extra excursion, it would indeed be a real pleasure to me to offer you a glass of Spanish wine on this occasion, which I myself have brought with me from my travels from the Barrancos de Santa Barbara, and which you will probably never have tasted, at least not of this purity, and beautiful quality. Here comes my automobile. May I kindly ask the gentleman to get in and take a seat? Count Steineck and the Viscount at first expressed in many terms the superfluousness of this step. After all, without all these formalities, they were all too convinced that their friend's rank and title were real. They did not doubt for a moment. But the commissary, whom his more dexterous friend Henry Stern could not at present give good advice, the commissary was most welcome this remedy. And he was already in the vehicle when Lord Brigham, and after this, though still mumbling and hesitant, the two noblemen took their seats. The car chugged and puffed on its bouncy wheels. After a few minutes she stopped in front of the large, distinguished house, of which the Lord occupied the first floor. When they arrived at the house, the Englishman, in his native tongue, gave an order to the servant. Then he said, turning to the three masters, Before we move on to the business part, I'd like to introduce you to my wine, of which I have just praised you. I'll get you the papers at that time about which I have spoken to you. The commissioner would have loved to have followed the lord, who disappeared from the Indian drawing room through the variegated draperies. But the dignity and the proud, calm tranquility of the two noblemen, who so dignified in their easy chairs, kept him glued to his seat. He took a deep breath, then, as the voice of the lord rang out from the adjoining room. He spoke in the familiar melodious tone. Just a moment, gentlemen. I placed the papers among all sorts of other papers. I must search for a moment, but soon I shall have found everything. Then there was dead silence. And in the Indies drawing room, too, the three gentlemen sat stock still and silently waiting for each other. Paper rustling had been heard in the beginning. But that too was silenced. And one minute after the other passed. No servant appeared with the wine. No gentleman returned with the papers that would prove his nobility. When about five minutes had elapsed, the commissioner became very impatient. The two gentlemen, too, began to shift restlessly in their comfortable seats. Finally, after mutual consultation, it was decided to take a look in the adjoining room. It was crazy. Where was the lord now? But when the commissioner got up to have a look behind the colorful draperies, Count Steinek objected. 
He spoke in a disgruntled, somewhat reproachful tone. We are here in a strange house, sirs. I hope you'll keep thinking about that. You are right. The Viscount immediately agreed. Nevertheless, I don't think our friend would blame us if we go and see him. After all, something may well have happened to him. Do you think? asked Steinek. No, no, it will not be. Lord Brigham looked for the papers. He could not have suspected for a moment that people would doubt the genuineness of his nobility, and now the papers are not so obvious. Certainly, but an accident can happen to anyone. What do you think, Commissioner? The Commissioner had said little so far. He didn't feel very at ease in the presence of those high uncles, who, by their weighty actions, kept him glued to the chair. And more than ever he felt his lack of independence, which prevented him from acting decisively. But now he came out. At the Viscount's question he let out a mocking laugh. And although the Count shook his shoulders unwillingly and raised his eyebrows as if the saying of von Hentar seemed foolish to him, Peter Bocher was not intimidated by it this time. He said. Gentlemen, I'll tell you my opinion. This so-called lord is making fun of you and me. And you certainly won't blame me if I say I'm not here to be fooled by a crook. I don't think, gentlemen, to believe even for a moment the fairy tales which this so-called lord is trying to tell us all. I'm going to check it out. Butcher jumped up with a resolute gesture. He pushed aside the heavy drapes and entered the adjoining room. The other two looked at each other for a few seconds in astonishment. What to do? They hesitated for a moment. But, after a moment's hesitation, they followed the commissary. Now, what have I told you? The detective exclaimed in a savage tone. What did I say? Oh! How stupid have I been! How careless I have acted! I should have arrested the fellow at once! Indeed! The room was empty. Completely empty. And when the gentlemen went to the door leading out into the corridor, they found, to their no small surprise and amazement that it was, closed. The exit leading out of the Indies drawing room was also barred. So the servant must have been given an assignment other than to fetch Spanish wine from the cellar and present it to the guests. That was a beautiful history, a beautiful lot. Steinach and the Viscount looked at each other with faces that expressed anything but pleasant sensation. And the chief of detectives had a head as red as a lobster from sheer anger and regret. Oh! If only he had followed his will. If only he hadn't been so wavering, turned so slack. If only he had acted on his own initiative. How sorry he was. A great regret. What am I to do now? He exclaimed in utter despair. Instead of receiving a reward, instead of being promoted, I will now be severely scolded by my superiors. And you, gentlemen. You are partly to blame for this. Yes indeed. You are complicit. Listen, dear friend, began Count Steinach, with a high-pitched nose, listen. You must, a, eh, a, eh, you must, no, that's not the way, a, eh, a, eh, that's really not the right tone, no, not the right tone, a, eh, a, eh, what do you say, dear Viscount, a, eh, a, eh, what do you say, is that the right tone, to say to us, millionaires club members, say, Viscount, what do you think, a, eh, a, eh, a, eh, that's why the motor car puffed out so much later, said the Viscount in a thoughtful tone, and the rustling in the next room dash stopped suddenly, yes, right, I did, heard right, I thought, I imagined it so clearly, no, no, I was not mistaken, tell me, Commissioner, didn't you hear that too, dash that was quite obvious, wasn't it, isn't it, Count? Yes, but, a, eh, a, eh, very clearly, very clearly indeed, that cop should have heard that, a, eh, a, eh, yes, why didn't the policeman hear that, that is not appropriate, a, eh, a, eh, no, that is not appropriate, if one is a police commissioner after all, of the criminal investigation department, that's unheard of, that's totally inappropriate, a, eh, a. Eh. Furious, like a vexed animal, the commissioner kicked against the closed door until it sprang open. Then he flew down the stairs, but the automobile was gone. That Lord Brigham aka John Raffles in this vehicle which had been huffing and waiting, the wide world had moved in to seek and find freedom there, Peter Bocher soon understood as clearly as did the two millionaires, who had now also come down. Later on, also on the part of the Millionaires Club, every effort was made to track down the clever adventurer, who had all been far too clever. 
But even the indefatigable Henry Stern failed to do this, who left nothing undone. First much, much later, he and the wanted would meet again in the Indian fairyland, where nature has created so many wonders that even the wildest adventurer can give in to his unbridled fantasy. The End Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila